Welcome to EMS at Sea Level, from my home to yours. I am with Douglas Kent of Chain Innovation. Douglas, thanks for taking the time to chat today. Before we get into the questions, can you just give me a quick introduction for our viewers to yourself and to the consultancy you operate within? Sure. So Douglas Kent, as you mentioned, I primarily work as a managing partner for Chain Innovation. Our mission is really to assist multinational global organizations in their supply chain transformation efforts. So more in a coaching standpoint, helping teams mm -hmm. identify opportunities for transformation and see those through. Okay. And when we look specifically over the last, um, the last few months, it's probably been one of the most disruptive periods we've seen in terms of supply chain. We were hit with a um, supply disruption where they've been hit with a equally substantial demand disruption in various different markets, plus the kind of workplace disruption. How has that been for your clients and what have they been kind of screaming out to you say, hey, Douglas, help us with this? Well, I think for, for most, um, it may have caught them just a little bit of off, off guard. Um, mm -hmm. I think it really has been a test of the resiliency of the supply chain, which of course many companies have consistently struggled with, but the reality of it, it brought everything to life, right? It really tested um, the ability to, to respond to all different types of external market conditions. Um, luckily, we've had some preparation for that, so some organizations have certainly fared better than others. But it did highlight a lot of vulnerability in organizations where the ability to take decisions rapidly uh, may be a struggling competency for many companies. Yeah, and you talk about resilience, and I think that's huge. And I think along with that, people are really thinking hard about agility and speed and how they, how they can operate. And you talked about having that, um, that ability to make far, fast decisions. That comes from real-time data was there a case where you felt there were kind of haves and have-nots in terms of the digital world that were more ready and more capable what were the supply chains that were that were most resilient during this period well i think the resiliency really comes from the ability to plan and replan very quickly so i think the organizations that fare very well and in any time of external influence, right? The ones that could really manage those risk conditions well are the ones that have a formal planning process, right? From, and I'm talking about strategic all the way through the tactical and operational planning. So companies that are used to that, that are constantly evaluating external market forces and are used to large demand shifts or supply constraints and and how organizationally they can cross-functionally take those decisions for the betterment of their customers and their own profitability are the mm -hmm. ones that tend for, to, to fare very well in that type of condition. The ones that aren't so mature in the area of supply chain planning, running very formal PSYOP processes and are used to that kind of decision making, um, those, those who aren't mature there are the ones that typically will fail, particularly when hit with such a such a strong external influence like we've seen relative to the pandemic. Yeah, so when you look at those, obviously there's that preparedness with respect to having the, the management tools and the data available and the systems and everything in place. What do you see as some of the other factors that made it harder or easier in the supply chain? Was it those that were in particular geographies, those that had more diverse supply chains? What, what were the, big factors when you looked at supply chains that you thought these ones are gonna, going to struggle regardless of their operational skill? Well, I think, I mean, there are probably some, some factors that made it more difficult for others. As you mentioned, things like the global reach or the multinational footprint of companies certainly um, make that more complex and that decision-making more difficult. Um, ones that have traditionally outsourced models, so perhaps the visibility into the tier one, beyond the tier one supplier, mm -hmm. but into the tier two supplier, um, also certainly complicates the model. Um, ones that have manufacturing, sourcing, and decision making in three different geographies, you know, that sort of yeah. multinational uh, influence has certainly caused um, some problems there. So I think 
some of that globality, some of that uh, yeah. outsourced mentality, et cetera, really, again, brought forward some of the vulnerabilities that made um, you know, this particular instance a struggle. And, and to that respect also, hopefully overcoming that struggle will also give them a lot more capability going forward in the future. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned to me before before we came on air that chaos chaos creates consultancy, um, which I think is should should be everybody's uh, should be everybody's hashtag at the moment. But uh, what what is it that people are asking to do now when they come to you with, hey, we've had this problem, Douglas. It's been really really challenging for us. Are they looking for help out of their current situation or are they looking to create something more robust, more agile, more adaptable for the future? I think at this point, it's the latter. I think, um, you know, there's the recovery piece, which of course comes first. How do we get ourselves out of the mess that we find ourselves in? Uh, but now it's how do I strengthen the organization to protect myself against, uh, you know, any sort of future events. and. It's not just about business continuity, but it's 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 really about again building that that er, that new era of continued resiliency. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, it falls into two kind of main areas across the supply chain. I mentioned already, of course, the plan maturity. That's that's absolutely key. Uh, rapid scenario planning, uh, what to do, quick decision making, turning off supply where I need to. Uh, making sure that I'm planning for delivery and warehousing capacities where I may not have had to do that in the past because the flow through is uninterrupted. Um, but also to the point you made earlier around enablement, right? Mm -hmm. Digital enablement. I mean, just uh, beyond just the buzzwords that we've typically, you know, uh, migrated to and say, this is interesting, it's sexy, it's new, let's, let's think about these new capabilities. But actually, not just uh, you know automating what we do from a supply chain for an efficiency perspective, but but developing new operating models that are digitally enabled that will that will build that resiliency in, allow people to work from home, allow mm -hmm. touchless points with our consumer base, things of that sort. So I, if I had to sum it up into two areas where I think companies uh, are finding opportunity to create a new way to manage this resiliency. It's in the area of supply chain planning and the corresponding enablement, not the least, of course, is digital enablement for supply chain. Yeah, I want to talk about digital transformation, but when just before we do that, I wanted to come back on something you said about, um, about the inventory side of things, um, because I've got a sense that we move very aggressively towards a just-in-time thing. Inventory became a bit of an enemy, certainly for uh, for some companies, and often in um, earnings calls, you'd hear about, you know, let's reduce inventory to zero. Those that had just-in-time weren't very equipped for a just-in-case scenario. Have people's minds shifted a little bit, and is is like strategic, well-deployed inventory become more important again? Um, I, yeah, a hundred percent. I think we're going to see a very dramatic shift in our view of inventory. And I would describe it as a view of inventory as a liability versus an asset. Right. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's really that, that, that shift that the pandemic is really causing us to think about is, um, taking advantage of having inventory versus being fearful of having too much. Yeah. Right. So, so that view, that shift of view from liability to asset, I, I think that that will absolutely continue. I think you'll see that the, the, the balance sheet will fill up more than it did in the past and that won't be considered necessarily to be a bad thing. Um, yeah. And then of course, um, inventory as it relates to the positioning of inventory, how many, how many points of positioning, how many forward stocking locations, warehousing yeah. centers, distribution centers are we gonna need to have? So I think that whole, the whole view of network optimization and the inventory that supports that network is going to undergo uh, a major transformation. And many of the companies that I've been talking to are, are really renewing their, let's say, their capability or their ability um, to be able to do network optimization, to consider, um, you know, differentiated inventory models in order to support their supply chain. 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting, you know, some of us are um, old enough and have been in supply chain long enough to remember the tech wreck of kind of 2000, 2001. And there was a massive inventory overhang problem there, but it wasn't visible uh, inventory. People didn't know where it was. People didn't know what they had. People didn't know whether it was redundant. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. So I think perhaps now, if the tools are there and the, um, the digitally enabled tools allow you to properly see where your inventory is and, and manage it well, then it becomes it becomes less of an issue. Let's talk about that digital disruption and that digital yeah. transformation a bit. What are the key factors to that happening? Is it is it a willingness on on the part of the OEMs or is it the the tools available like artificial intelligence, like powerful uh, big data analytics? Well, I think we've uh, we, we're starting to look at the migration towards some of these tools as a necessary evil, but but um, I think before they became interesting for us and you saw um, some adoption in terms of the digital world, but a lot still related to more efficiencies, I think, mm -hmm. than, than really using it to build new operating models. And I think that's where we're gonna see the adoption, uh, the acceleration of the adoption of new digital models to become even more important. So rethinking the way we do business as opposed to just automating how we do it. Um, and, and I think, you know, the least of which is, you know, things like, you know, just the consumer touch point that may be completely virtual now in many instances, just causes, a, you know, quite a lot of, um, you know, new digital capabilities that we might have had as an ancillary part of the way we do business as opposed to the main part of the way we do business. I mean, I've certainly looked at numbers. Uh, as you know, we just did a, a webinar in Africa recently. And just taking a look at the numbers of, of, of individuals that have become familiar with utilizing digital capabilities yeah. in a consumer purchase world, um, you know, we're talking about numbers two or three X uh, in terms yeah. of, of getting familiar with that. People, you know, uh, you know, my mother doesn't have a debit card, right? Uh, well, she does now, right? Um, yeah. So um, I think just, just seeing that kind of migration towards, um, you know, rethinking a, a, a digital experience for a consumer that mm. um, it goes beyond just a potential new channel development, but rather a yeah. whole new way of doing business. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's clearly that from the consumer side, but actually as you drive down the supply chain side as well, we're seeing disruptive models there, like, uh, you know, the really advanced manufacturing platforms that maybe make parts that, that will interrogate a, a bill of materials and um, provide instant quotes and all those kind of things. Do you see a big role for artificial intelligence in, in those systems, both at the supply chain management and at the consumer interface end? Um, yeah, I absolutely, absolutely do. Again, I think um, the, the lesser the reliance on the human individual is becoming very important. And as you mentioned, um, certainly not just in the B2C touch points, but most certainly in the B2B touch points as well. Um, and, and uh, you know, these types of technologies are going to be incredibly important in the interactions between companies with, with, that don't even have a consumer touch point. So absolutely, I believe that that will, that will certainly be the case. And I, again, I think it's been on the radar. It's not like mm. this is a new thing. I just think that the acceleration, I, I heard someone quote the other day that we, we accelerated two years of, of, of thought around the digital capabilities in two months, right? Um, yeah. And, and I think going back to, you know, investment strategies for B2B companies, I think you're going to see these sort of nice to have capabilities were always the ones that got pushed down on the list of investments um, yeah. because there wasn't a proven case point for maybe some of the adoption and now of course unfortunately through the bad experiences that companies have i think that that changes the mindset quite a lot yeah um again to similar to the point about you know inventory and assets it's the same with these kind of new innovations etc 
Um, so I think that acceleration, that budgeting approval for these new investments, the ability to pilot and proof of concept some of these things is accelerating beyond imaginable you know, expectations. So, yeah. um, so and, and there's, you know, there's many, many examples, you know, just the ability for us to do an interview via, yeah. you know, <laughs> a WebEx or Zoom or other technology, yeah. you know, just look at the numbers of, you know, Zoom downloads in, in yeah. the context of a single month, which was, you know, the same volume as, you know, maybe two quarters of the year prior. Yeah, no, it's it's been amazing. One of the things I wanted to explore with you, because I saw that presentation you did for um, Chainovation Africa, um, is a couple of the methodologies you use. One of the things I really liked was the four R's, the resolve, recover, reimagine, and reform. So I wanted to look at that. Um, and then after that, let's talk a little bit about the the score model, which you've um, which you've created and you've been using for some time. Sure. So let's start with these four R's. Yeah. So um, I think to the earlier point, uh, most companies are now sort of into that getting back to business, so going through the resolve the existing problem and then starting the recovery process. Um, but back to this concept of reimagine um, mm. again. Um, supply chain, you know, we don't have a supply chain, we have supply chains and um, the operating models that need to support that are going to require the reimagination about how that can work. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more focus on building resiliency into those supply chains and with that resiliency attribute, right, in the SCORE model we talk about three major customer facing attributes, right, we talk about um, the resiliency part of it, which is uh, what we call agility from the score model standpoint, um, combined with the responsiveness or our cycle times and, and our lead times, but also the reliability around metrics like perfect order fulfillment, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in order to, to get that resiliency, arguably we could say all of those attributes are gonna be important to us. So how do we distinguish operating models and define operating models and, and be able to sustain those that will deliver uh, across all of those key attributes, but do it at a cost to serve basis that, that allows us to also uh, operate those models, uh, you know, profitably and with, re, you know, with um, also giving back our, our stakeholder returns that we might expect. Um, and then the reform is really about how do we how do we keep those sustainable in the changing world of the regulatory environments that are likely mm. to, to challenge our existing operating models in a way that we've never seen before. Regulatory and compliance has always been difficult because it's, a, it's an external influence on us, but now we don't know who we can trade with and where we can travel yeah. to and, and, and you know, a lot of different complexities that I think are gonna challenge uh, us going forward. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. And those external influences, we saw those in um, 2019 substantially with trade wars and tariffs and, uh, and so forth. And then we were hit with this, uh, obviously with this massive um, pandemic thing. Before we wrap up, I just really wanted to ask, um, you know, if someone's in a position where they are seeing their supply chain challenged um, and they, you know, they're feeling a little bit lost in terms of that, one, what advice would you give? And two, where, where are the resources available to them? Where, where should they be reaching out? Is it associations? Is it to um, people like yourselves? How do they, how do they get in touch? Well, I, I think going back to the second part of your previous question on the score model. So, as you know, the supply chain operations reference model has been the, you know, the most influential um, reference model for supply chains now for more than two decades. Um, what does it allow us to do? It allows us to, in a standard way, using a standard language, really diagnose the health of our supply chain so that we can understand factually not emotionally what's going on within our supply chain that's working and not working and gives us that that opportunity to vision out what the future state should look like so when we look at transformation opportunities it's really about that get the teams together that really understand um, the you know the goods and the bads what we call the defects the disconnects associated with the supply chain model that out and really construct 
as we might do in a, in a more simplistic Kaizen-like event, right? Really mm. take a, a deep dive look at it, but at a, at a higher level of transformation. So like Lean and Six Sigma, what we do oftentimes, you know, Lean is about the identification of the waste and the removal of that waste from our process structure. And Six Sigma helps us build stability in those processes once those wastes are removed. When we apply the SCORE model to transformation, it doesn't just take a look at, you know, the efficiency of the process. It asks us the question, is it the right process? Is this a process we should even be doing? Or, or maybe even more importantly in today's world is what process aren't we doing that we should? And that really leads to that step change transformation effort. So organizations like ASCM, the Associated Supply Chain Management, SAFIX, local chapter partner for, for ASCM and within South Africa, these types of associations which are helping to build and uh, the guidance around the use of the model for transformation efforts are really you know, a go-to place. And of course, that's the, the type of work, the application of those models that we tend to focus on because it's proven. It's proven over time, right? I mean as you say, you know, this isn't the first time we've been hit with, you know, the need to make transformational change. Yeah. Dot com bomb was certainly one of them. Pandemic is one. Trade tariff wars of last year were another's, right? We're, and these aren't going to go away. They're going to increase mm. in frequency. So the more that we can learn how to self-diagnose, um, how to build that resiliency into our organizations, our policies, our processes, our technologies, these are going to be the key for the future. Yeah, and I guess if anybody's looking for access to those or advice, quickest route is just to, just to connect to you on LinkedIn and um, you'll be able to provide those links and, and connect those people up, I guess. Yeah, certainly we can, we can provide some guidance on that. And of course, we do offer training on the model as well. Yeah. So SCORE professional training, which has been a big uh, factor for getting that that education I, again building that capability in-house not yeah. necessarily always relying on an external source for that um, and that's what the training and the coaching and the guidance that we provide helps to offer yeah it's great to um, it's great to train that muscle um, and get that get that refined as much as possible um, great time to drive change in supply chains at the moment a good time to be a supply chain manager and People are listening. What do you think? Never a dull moment. Absolutely. <laughs> As we said, when there's chaos, there's consultancy, and there's nobody who's going to deny the degree of chaos in the market today. Absolutely. Well, Douglas, absolute pleasure to chat to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your candor. To everybody that watched the MS at Sea Level, thank you for your time too. Stay safe, and I look forward to talking again soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>